my pleasure to introduce Ilera Poport from the Paris School of Economics, who's going to present a paper on migration and cultural change today, jointly written with Salim Sardoshal and Arthur Silve, who are both online with us today, and we're grateful for this. So uh, Ilel is also one of the organizers of this seminar series that we launched almost uh, six months ago, day by day. So Ilel, the floor is yours. You have uh, 45 minutes, as usual. Okay, thank you, Simone, for the introduction and the opportunity to present. So, as you said, this is joint work with uh, Soline and Arthur, who are here. Soline is a junior professor of migration economics at Humboldt University, and Arthur is an assistant professor at Laval uh, University in uh, Quebec. This is a paper we started some, some time ago, and it's only recently that we felt we we're happy enough with the paper to have it in a working paper. So it came out last uh, month in a two working paper series. So you can find the paper easily uh, online. So what is it about? It's migration and, and cultural change, as you see in the title. I think a, a good way to motivate and start the paper is to ask uh, you as, as participants to try to guess what the paper is about. And uh, I will guess that your guess is that we are going to talk about how immigrants change uh, the culture of the receiving uh, societies. And that's uh, partly correct. Indeed, we are going to talk about this because this is a very important topic. And this is the topic when we say immigration or migration and culture, this is what everybody, at least in the OECD countries, thinks about. Uh, and it's a very important dimension of public debate about uh, immigration, whether immigration is changing the culture of the receiving countries. But we will try to have a more global view of this question and say, well, if you think out of the blue, how does migration affect culture, then you could think, you know, it affects the culture of the receiving countries, but it could also affect migrants themselves. They, they can assimilate and it can also affect people in their home country through what is called social remittances and so on. So we will try to make sense of these different things, these different aspects of migration and cultural change, and uh, try to see which of these aspects are the most important to explain the dynamics of migration and culture uh, globally. So to, to motivate uh, further this paper, we start with two quotes, one by Thomas Jefferson, so more than two centuries ago, shortly after the United States of America became independent. And this quote essentially shows that the fathers of uh, the American constitution and, and democracy were worried that immigrants coming from monarchies, from uh, countries with, uh, you know, autarkic uh, regimes would not follow the principles of democracy and would, in the words of Jefferson, would infuse their own uh, political values and, and preferences into the United States. And that could be an impediment to expanding and extending the, the American democracy. So they were worried uh, about this dissemination in the world we, we, we will use in, in what's coming, the dissemination of uh, home country values into the host country. So that would be one example of dissemination uh, as we will define it. Jumping more than two centuries later, this worry in the current debate, the, this concern that immigrants are transforming the culture of the receiving countries was very much and very prominently expressed in this well-known book by Michel Houellebecq, maybe the most popular contemporary French writer, in a book called Submission, which is actually a dystopia explaining how gradually uh, France is becoming an Islamic uh, country. And you can think if in your own country, what are the, you know, the debates about immigration and culture and uh, certainly this question about the transformation of the receiving societies uh, by the culture of immigrants has been 
pointed out as uh, one of the sources of the rise of populism, of the extreme right, and, and so on. So that dimension will be very much present in our paper, but our paper will not be restricted to this dimension. So uh, Donald Trump, for example, is uh, in the context of the US has, very, has been very vocal about you know, the, the dangers of immigration, not just for the economy, but also for, for the culture of the United States and for Europe. And he was uh, even kind enough to warn uh, European leaders that they'd better watch themselves in his terms because immigration is changing the culture of Europe. And also economists who have written very prominent economists such as Paul Collier or uh, George Borjas, who has been commenting on uh, Collier's book, have expressed this worry that immigration makes uh, social cohesion more difficult in the host societies and that can be uh, handicap. And Bojas also expressed this worry that, you know, when we compute the immigration surplus, we don't take into account this potentially uh, negative externality that if immigrants uh, bring with them inefficient norms and cultures from an economic viewpoint, then this is an additional loss for the economy, for the receiving economy. So again, uh, this is only one part of the puzzle we, we want to try to solve. We want to look at migration and cultural change globally and have the other dimensions, especially what is happening in the sending countries of migrants in mind as well. So the literature we relate to is this uh, really fast expanding economics literature on culture. So the economics of culture, we have two sets of uh, lines of, of thought of research. One trying to explain cultural change, uh, relying mostly on you know, uh, weather conditions and environmental, environmental conditions to explain deep-rooted cultural factors but also a lot of papers trying to explain cultural change, not just uh, persistence. I, uh, looking at uh, some more specific uh, dimensions of culture, such as uh, whatever gender uh, attitudes, uh, labor force participation of women, and th these type of things. And I think in spirit, the papers which are maybe the most connected to, to what we do are papers that look at how cultural heterogeneity or diversity of polarization is unfolding in, in certain countries, especially the United States. So is the United States becoming more you know, homogenous or more polarized or more heterogeneous culturally over time? And in a sense, what we are doing is to look at whether countries uh, are becoming more close, more similar culturally, or uh, more dissimilar, more distant, and what is the role of migration in explaining these uh, movements. So the second big line of literature we relate to is the, the literature on cultural change and globalization. So there are many you know, big picture theses in political science and sociology and so on. So is the world becoming a global village? Uh, do we have a clash of civilization and so on? So at a more modest uh, scale, we ask whether certain dimensions of globalization, such as that we can capture bilaterally, such as trade or migration, affect cultural formation in both countries and do uh, they make them culturally closer or more distant? So the, from this viewpoint, maybe uh, we're closest to recent papers by uh, Tonique Verdier and different co-authors who have looked at this question for trade. And in the last uh, paper in the JIE, uh, finding that trade makes exchanging countries culturally uh, closer. So in their view, trade is a factor of cultural uh, convergence. We are not aware of uh, papers doing, uh, uh, asking the question for migration. And this is what we are going to do. And we do, I think, a bit more than this. We, we also uh, deal with, with trade, as you will see. And uh, we have a model that will guide us because eventually the question we want to ask is, 
not just the factual question, does migration make sending and receiving countries culturally more similar or more distant, but we also want to know the direction of convergence. Is it the sending country coming closer to culturally to the receiving country or the opposite? And what are the mechanisms behind whatever uh, result we get in terms of convergence or divergence? So to guide the analysis, because this is a very complex uh, question, we will rely very much on, on theory. So we rely on theory, not just because we like theory, but because essentially what we, we would be unable to say anything really interesting without theoretical uh, guidance. Uh, as you will see, the direct result, the, the, the baseline result, that we get is compatible uh, and uh, which is convergence uh, is compatible with many different explanations and to be able to discriminate between these candidates mechanism we, we will need to uh, to rely on theory so because the the model is uh, relatively complex i mean it depends who you ask but uh, complex enough and I, I don't have much time i will give the intuition of the model, and then I will give the details a bit uh, later, but spinning a little bit on, on the details. So the main intuition uh, is summarized here on, on, this, uh, on this graph, on this figure, and it's a good way also to introduce the notations that we will rely on. So we have two countries, A and B, so in our case, France and the United States, we will call A the sending country and B the receiving country. So two countries and culture is modeled very simply. We have a cu culture of a country will be the cultural mix of a country that is the proportion of different cultural types. So we have two cultural types here. As you can see, we have the blue people and the green people. After trying different illustrative example, we came out with the conclusion that talking about sports is the most illustrative uh, metaphor. So we have, say, football lovers and baseball lovers. So in France, you see there is a majority of green people. So green would be football lovers and the minority of blue people and blue would be uh, baseball lovers. In the United States, we have uh, the, the opposite. We have a majority of blue people and a minority of green people. So a majority of baseball lovers and a minority of football lovers. For the sake of notations, I, and we have two types, I and J, so green, uh, blue and green. So I being in most notations, the cultural type of the minority group in the sending country. And then between the sending country and the receiving country, we'll have migration between France and the US. People migrate for two reasons. One is the economic gains. You have a gain from migrating. If so, you have an incentive to migrate. You can have a loss, economic loss from migration. In that case, you have a disincentive or a negative incentive to, to move. And we will assume that that gain is distributed somehow between people. Some have a, a very high economic gain and some have a very high economic loss from, from moving. And there is some distribution between uh, these extreme losses and extreme gains. And there is a cultural gain from migration. We assume that people can be characterized by homophily. They like to be surrounded by people who are similar to them. So if you are, for example, a democracy lover, you prefer to live in a democracy than in an autocracy. Uh, if you, are, uh, you want big families, uh, you like to be surrounded by people who love children, and if you don't like children, you like to be uh, among people who are like you, and so on, okay? So if you are the minority type in the sending country in France, you have a gain from moving to the country where your type is more represented than in your home country. This explains why the minority type will culturally will be overrepresented to the extent that there is some cultural self-selection. The minority type will be overrepresented among migrants. So here you have more baseball lovers in proportion 
among French immigrants to the United States than you have uh, baseball lovers in France. But in the realistic case, we will assume that still this uh, proportion of baseball lovers among French immigrants uh, will be uh, lower than the proportion of baseball lovers uh, in the US. Again, this is not necessarily the case, but this will be the interesting case, let's say. Although we will deal with the other. So here, with this simple figure, you already have the ingredients of the model, and you also have two mechanisms that will be static ones, compositional mechanisms. One is cultural self-selection. The fact that the minority type is overrepresented, tends to be overrepresented among immigrants. So that's cultural self-selection. And this will be a source of divergence because the few baseball lovers in France will be even less numerous uh, because will be depleted because of immigration. So th that will make France culturally even more different than the US. But then the French immigrants that come to the US are somehow a mix between the French and the uh, American cultural type. And the fact that they come to the US will create mixing between the two uh, populations. And that mixing will uh, create cultural convergence. So you see here, we have self-selection creating divergence, okay? And so divergence the, with the sending country moving away from the receiving country and cultural mixing uh, through immigration, which is creating convergence with the receiving country converging toward the sending country. So with this simple figure, we can already say intuitively what we get from two compositional mechanisms. Now, in the, in the model, when I will present it, we will add not just compositional, but also some uh, mechanisms of dynamic cultural formation, dynamic cultural transmission. And there is no way I can show them on the figure, but I can already mention intuitively what they are. We can have dynamically cultural transmission from the natives of the destination country to the immigrants. So that's called assimilation, okay? When the immigrants adopt the culture of the natives of the host country. You can have cultural dissemination when immigrants disseminate their culture at destination. And we can have what I mentioned already called social or cultural remittances when the immigrants at destination send back the country of the host country toward their home country. Okay, so the, the, the model will make sense of these uh, five different mechanisms, two compositional mechanisms and three dynamic transmission mechanisms. And we'll make predictions for each of them and uh, we'll uh, give us some testable prediction, distinctive testable prediction that will allow us to uh, to discriminate between them. Okay, so that's more or less how the paper is organized. Uh, before I jump to the model, I give you some evidence on these different channels. So I mentioned five channels, cultural selection, mixing, assimilation, dissemination, and cultural remittances. This could be things that we, we thought exist, uh, but, but without uh, strong evidence about them. Uh, no, these five different mechanisms are very well documented uh, in the literature. We have many papers on each of them. For example, the first uh, compositional mechanism, which is cultural selection. Uh, if you think that the relevant dimension of culture you want to talk about is political views, then uh, self-selection on political views is called the exit effect after the very well-known work of uh, Albert uh, Hirschman. And there are you know, different papers, uh, including mine with, with uh, Thomas Barsby, which is still uh, in progress, looking at the effect of this political self-selection on the, the, the political evolution of the sending country. Uh, there are a few papers on other dimensions of culture, such as individual values. Uh, there is a working paper on Italy, looking at the degree of morality or civicness of students and showing that it's a strong predictor 
of whether they emigrate or not. A few weeks ago, we had a presentation in this seminar by uh, Sophie Beknitsen of her paper on Sweden showing that, you know, people with individualistic uh, values uh, were much more likely to emigrate and that this strongly affected the evolution of culture and politics in the sending countries, in the origin countries, uh, especially the, uh, these were Scandinavian countries, especially Sweden. There is, uh, you know, in the realms of uh, fertility, behavior and preferences also uh, a lot of historical evidence that, uh, uh, you know, people who wanted to leave uh, the rural areas of their uh, country in Europe chose either to go to, to work in, in cities nearby or chose to go to the new world and that this choice was partly driven by preferences for fertility. If you wanted big families, then you would you know, go to the new world and start a family farm. Or if you wanted small families, then you would go to the city and, and work in, the, in, in manufacturing. Okay, and so on. So that's for the first mechanism. Second mechanism, cultural mixing, I will be very brief. I think that the, the notion of a melting pot is about cultural mixing that, you know, everyone uh, brings uh, its own ingredi ingredients to the pot. So no need to expand further on this. Also on assimilation, tons of uh, papers, uh, most recently all the works with um, Ramitsky and and Ericsson and, and Lea Bustan and so on, so the, for super well documenting this in, in, in the US, but this has been shown in many different contexts. So I would say almost strangely enough, given that when we talk about migration and cultural change, the first uh, dimension that comes to mind is what we call cultural dissemination. So the fact that immigrants disseminate their culture to the natives, there is not so much strong evidence on this. One well-identified paper doing this recently is the one by Jarotskin and Zorovskaya, where they exploit the fact that Stalin deported certain minorities uh, during World War II to Siberia, so the, either Germans from the, the Volga Valley or Chechens from the Chechnya, so they named the Kafkaz region and they were deported to Siberia. So Siberian, either native or Russian populations were uh, exposed to these uh, different types of immigrants, which were arguably very different culturally. And they show that this affected long run uh, differences in culture between the exposed population. But apart from this, I don't know, maybe if you, you do, you, you, you send us uh, references. Uh, the, what I showed earlier with Collier and Borjas, uh, it's more an opinion, right? They, they are worried, they express a concern, but it's not based on, on research, okay? And the last uh, channel of cultural remittances also uh, is a relatively new concept coined by sociologists in the late 90s. But in economics, there have been uh, many papers looking at these cultural remittances for political preferences, for preferences for fertility, and, and so on. Okay, so here is the roadmap for the talk. We will start with a, a model to structure IDs and uh, make sense of the complexity of this question. And then we will move to the empirical analysis. For the empirical analysis, we need to have something to regress. So we need a left hand side and the left hand side is not uh, ready to use existing somewhere. So we had to build it. So what uh, we did is to build a set of measures of cultural proximity using the one uh, survey, the world value survey, which gives us, uh, you know, uh, some measures of uh, cultural values and beliefs and preferences, which can be made comparable across uh, countries and over time. And then we will test the predictions of the model with uh, using these cultural uh, distance measures on the left and on the right, we will have our variable of interest, which is uh, my bilateral migration, but we will also have different controls and, and, and a rich set of fixed effects, as you will see, and then we will conclude. And the conclusion is not just do we get convergence or divergence, which I think is a very important factual question, but also 
what is the direction of uh, convergence or divergence and what is the likely mechanism behind whatever we find, okay? So that's the plan. So let's move to the model. So you already know some of the notations and uh, some of the intuitions. So I think it will be relatively easy to follow. As I said, we have two countries, country A, country B. Country A is the potentially sending country. So agents from country A can move to country B. Individuals are characterized by two things. They have a certain gain from migration, small g, which has cumulative distribution, uh, capital G. And people can gain or lose from migrating based on whether they belong to the minority or the culturally dominant or the minority group uh, culturally. Okay, so if you are from the minority type in country A and, you're, and we use Q to denote the proportion of the minority type in the sending country, so that would be QA, that will be the majority type in the receiving country, that QB, so QA would be, if I use my sports example, QA would be the proportion of baseball lovers in France and QB would be the proportion of baseball lovers in the US. So if you're a baseball lover, you will have a cultural gain from moving from France to the US. If you are a football lover, you will have a cultural loss from moving from France to the US. And the condition to migrate, if we put a weight beta on the economic gain and one minus beta on the cultural gain, is that the overall gain is positive. So you may want to migrate if you have both a economic gain and a cultural gain, so the total will be positive and that's a no-brainer, you, you move, you emigrate. Or if you have a cultural gain that more than compensates for your economic loss or an economic gain that more than compensates for your cultural loss, okay? So we can characterize the agent, which is the critical agent, the one which is indifferent between migrating or not migrating and and given the distributions of individuals in, of both types, we can come up with what is the probability, which we call pi, that a given migrant will be of type I, that is the minority type in the sending country, will be a baseball lover. So what is the proportion of baseball lovers among French immigrants to the US? And that's the proportion of baseball lovers in France times the probability they will migrate. Uh, divided by the, the same thing and, and uh, the equivalent for the, the majority type. Okay, so pi i is the proportion of the minority type among immigrants, as, as we said, to the extent that culture matters at least a little bit, this minority type will be overrepresented among immigrants. Okay, so just to fix ideas, let's go to the extreme. Let's put uh, zero weight uh, on beta, okay, on, on economics, uh, on, the, on the economic gain. So beta equals zero means no one has, the economic gain is irrelevant, only the cultural gain matters. Then only baseball lovers will emigrate uh, from France to the US and we will have complete cultural selection, okay, only baseball lovers among immigrants. And that's clearly cause for divergence, okay? Because of this strong cultural selection. To the opposite, if we put a weight beta equals one, now the cultural gain, culture becomes irrelevant in the migration decision and only the economic gain matters. And to the extent, which is what we assume, that the economic gain and the cultural types are distributed independently, then migrants will be a representative of the cultural mix in a home country and by coming to destination clearly we will create the, the maximum uh, mixing maybe not the maximum mixing but uh, clearly mixing and this mixing will be a source of convergence that was already clear I think uh, from the simple figure I showed before. So then we have the dynamic mechanism to introduce them we we build on the framework of Bézine and Verdier. For those of you who don't know it, I will uh, explain to, to you very briefly. 
uh, in the, the, the Bizim Verdier framework is a fra theoretical framework of cultural transmission whereby you have also two types and uh, parents can invest some effort uh, so that the child becomes like them. Okay, so if you're a football lover, you would buy, uh, you know, posters and take your child to the park to play football and to football game and so on. And, and the same if you're a baseball lover. So you put some effort in the hope that the child is of the same cultural type as you. And of course, not yet, of course, and, and you have some probability of succeeding. And with the complementary probability, if the child just doesn't care what you do, and the child is not interested in spending time with you or opening your presence, but just to go to the park alone, well, the child will pick in the park a role model, okay? The child will pick a friend. And that friend in the park could be a baseball lover or a football lover, could play baseball or football. And that with some probability, the child will pick baseball lover such as yourself or a football lover. And in that case, if you're a baseball lover, we'll have a different cultural type. Okay, so that's the Bizin uh, Verdier framework. What we add to this framework is this two country setting and migration. So this gives you more options. So we will call dissemination. In the model, dissemination is when a native child from the destination country picks an immigrant as role model, okay? Assimilation will be when an immigrant at destination picks a native as role model, and cultural remittances is when a child in a home country picks an, an immigrant in the destination country. So a French immigrant, we, we call this mon oncle d'Amérique, my uncle from America, so you pick an immigrant uh, from your home country as a role model, okay? So we play around with, uh, with the math and, and I, I will have to, to jump, but the, the, the idea is, uh, is quite simple, is that parents will choose the optimal level of effort, taking into account how valuable it is for them that their child is of the same cultural type and how costly it is to go to the park. Based on these optimal levels of effort for parents of type I and type J, you can characterize the steady state proportion of each type in the different situations. So this is for the dissemination model. In the dissemination model, you can compute the, the equilibrium or the steady state proportion of people of type I at, at destination. And you can use this uh, steady state uh, equation to do comparative statics and turn these comparative statics into predictions, okay? So using this expression uh, that I showed you on the previous uh, slide, the steady state proportion of uh, type I in the destination country, uh, one comparative static result is this one, which simply tells you that when immigrants, so dissemination is when immigrants are role models for the children at destination, okay? so with dissemination and i.e. with immigrants as role model, the cultural mix at destination will come closer to the cultural mix of migrants. And this will lead to convergence when migrants are the, the proportion of the minority type or the baseball, baseball lovers, let's say, among migrants is close to the one in the home country in France. So in fact, this is exactly that, like the compositional model. Okay, exactly like the compositional model, if migrants are close to, in terms of proportion, cultural mix, close to the home country cultural mix, then you get convergence. Okay, and the second, and, and this is not a distinctive prediction because as we know, we will have different mechanism that could yield convergence. But this one is maybe more interesting for what's to come, uh, is that it's not surprising, okay, it tells us that the proportion of baseball lovers is greater when you have more cultural selection among migrants. So when there are more baseball lovers among French immigrants to the United States, in the steady state, when immigrants pick uh, French immigrants as, as role model, then you have more divergence, okay, so that when you have more self-selection of migrants, you have more divergence. Okay, so again, this is the same prediction 
as in the compositional model, more cultural selection, more divergence. Okay, so this dissemination model and the compositional model have exactly the same predictions, less cultural selection, more convergence, more cultural selection, more divergence, okay? The assimilation model is not so interesting. It's essentially a mitigation of the dissemination uh, model and is going the other direction, essentially. And the, the model of cultural remittances, so you have the same procedure, you compute the optimal effort of parents, you characterize the steady state proportions of each cultural type, and you do the comparative statics. And here you get, again, some predictions with migrants as role models. So now we should write emigrants okay, as role models. So now we're talking about cultural remittances. So children in France adopting French emigrants in the United States as role model, then the cultural mix at home is pulled toward the cultural mix abroad. So we can have convergence, okay? When you have more migration, more convergence, and this is the one which is distinctive, the more cultural selection you have, the stronger the cultural convergence. So here we have a prediction which is opposite to the prediction we got from the compositional model and from the dissemination model. So more cultural selection, more cultural convergence, and here it's the home country converging toward the host country. So this is what the, the model gives us as, as a guidance. I have 10 minutes to go through the empirical part. So I already said that we use the World Value Survey, which has uh, six waves from the early 80s to uh, 2014. Uh, so we will build, uh, I will skip these descriptives, and uh, we build three different measures of uh, cultural distance between countries. The Euclidean distance is well known. The other ones are, the Erfindahl is uh, well known as well. So this is just to make sure that uh, our results are robust to the type of cultural distance measure we use, but essentially the Euclidean distance is comparing average uh, answers of two, if you want, representative individuals. So we make the, the average of the different questions and uh, how distant the typical response is in each country. The Canberra more insists on the, on the range, and the Erfindahl is essentially the uh, probability that two randomly picked individuals uh, are similar in terms of uh, their answers, okay? So I will show you results for these three measures uh, almost always. And the specification we use is very standard. Using these different uh, measures of cultural similarity, so CS, stands for cultural similarity. So we, we look at cultural similarity between country I, the sending country, country J, the receiving country at time T. Let me start with the set of fixed effects. So we have a dyadic fixed effect, a origin time fixed effect, a country time fixed effect. So whatever makes France cultural, uh, the culture of France in 2000 and the culture of the US in uh, 1990 and whatever makes you know France and the US at country pair what it is is but not changing over time is accounted for and our two variables of interest uh, our main variable of interest is migration between I and J we lag migration by one period so the world value survey has waves every five years so we lag by five year one period uh, you can see you can think of trade exports either as a control or as a variable of interest as, as you want, but uh, I, I won't show you results for trade here because essentially we have no results. Uh, it's not robust, not significant, nothing, but it's at least controlled for. So that's the specification we use, okay? So it's a, uh, we look essentially, uh, we exploit within pair variation over time, okay? I will say a word on identification because I know uh, it's an economic seminar, so we need to say something about identification, but I will be short. What is critical here is not the size of migration, but the composition, the cultural composition of migration flows, okay? So we may want to instrument for the size, but this will not change any, we will not tell us anything, okay? Uh, what is critical 
uh, here is the cultural composition, which is something we don't observe. And because we don't observe it, we cannot instrument it. Okay? So we believe that the structure of fixed effect is already accounting for most of the endogeneity concerns you may have, but because we are uh, professional skeptics and it's not enough, uh, I will say, well, here we have to rely heavily on theory also because there is no way we can instrument the cultural composition. Okay? I mean, maybe there is a way, but we don't observe it. So anyway, so that's for identification. This is the baseline result. Uh, you see, so I show you the, 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 the specification with all the fixed effect and controls. Okay, the controls are mostly trade. So controls are time variants at the country pair uh, level. So this is mostly trade and income differences. And we have the full set of fixed effects. Okay, so you see the bottom line here is that migration is always positive, is mostly significant. It, I, I should say it's robust, even though the Canberra result is uh, not significant because for example, in this slide it is, and the difference between the two is that the world value survey, as you know, is not a longitudinal panel, but it's also not a balanced panel. Okay, so every wave, in each country, different individuals are surveyed and the set of countries is not fixed. It evolves over time. There is some nucleus of countries, but the composition of the sample is changing. So when we move from the unbalanced to the balanced panel, we get also that migration is always uh, now positive and significant. And the result is robust across uh, measures of control similarity. So that's the factual question. That the, the, the answer to the factual question, does migration, is migration a source of cultural convergence or divergence? And the answer is a source of cultural convergence. Now this could be driven by compositional effects through mixing. This could be driven by dissemination with the host country converge to the home country or by cultural remittances with the home country converging to the host country. So now we will, First, do some, you know, uh, plausibility checks. Uh, some let, let's progress in, in this direction. Let's first discriminate between, uh, let's say, short-term and long-term effects, dynamic and static effects. Okay, so we do a few things to to do this. I think I show you just one result that, you know, compares, say, the short-run and the longer-run effect. So if we believe the compositional model matters, then we should have compositional creates instantaneous changes, okay? So if instead of, as in our baseline, we lag migration by five years, instead of this, we take the, the contemporaneous migration flow or a 10 year lag, well, if the compositional effect is what is driving the result, we should get, you know, that the no lag regression uh, captures our, our results which is not the case. Uh, to the contrary, when we lag not by five, but by 10 years, uh, we see again that the three measures are positive and, and significant, okay? So let's say, to be short, let, let's say that this is, uh, you know, invalidating the compositional effect as the, the central candidate to explain our results. So we are left with the two dynamic transmission mechanism, the ones from immigrants to the natives of the destination, which is called this dissemination, and the one uh, in the other direction with immigrants transferring culture from the host country to the home country. Okay, so I remind you the insights from the model. The more economic gains matter, the less cultural selection we have, the more convergence we should expect in the dissemination model and the less convergence we should expect in the cultural model. In the opposite, the more culture matters and the less the economy gain matters, the more culturally selected migrants will be, okay? The more convergence we should get in the cultural remittances model and the less convergence or the more divergence we should get in the dissemination model. So the question now is how can we approximate this balance in terms of incentives, uh, whether economics matters more or whether culture matters more in the decision to migrate. So one way to do it 
is to compare high skill and low skill migrants. So we have in, in the room, uh, I mean, in the virtual room, uh, many specialists of migrants uh, selection. So let me pick Simone, who has worked on, he doesn't know about this question, it's a surprise for him. If I ask you which type of migrants, Simone, have more economic gains from migration, the high skill or the low skill? It depends whether it's in absolute or relative terms. But what do we use in most of the economics literature? You would use the linear specification as in Groger and Anson, so you would say the high skill. But that's the minority type, I would say, culturally. Uh, most people use the Roy Bochas model. It's, so if you go with the Roy Bochas model, which yeah. is the canonical model behind most models of migrant selection, uh, including in your work and mine, you, we, we go with the implicit assumption that the gains from migration are higher for the low skill. Okay, so without taking a stance whether culture matter more for the low skill or high skill, just say because the economic gain is higher for the low skill, okay, let's see whether we have any difference first between low skill and high skill migration. If we separate our migration variable bilateral flows into low and high skill, what you see here is that the low skill, if anything, tend to create uh, divergence and the high skill tend to create cultural convergence. Okay, we have a positive coefficient for high skill and a negative coefficient for low skill. So this is to say when the economic gain is high, we have divergence. When the, and when it is low, we have convergence. This is totally inconsistent with the dissemination model, which predicted exactly the opposite and completely consistent with the fact that uh, we, with the cultural remittances model. Let's approach the same thing in another way. Let's create a dummy, uh, as you see here, which we call CSED. So CSED means cultural similarity, economic distance. Okay, so CS stands for the group of dyadic, uh, of, of country pairs, okay, which are above median cultural similarity. Okay, so high cultural similarity and ED is high economic distance. Okay, so the combination of the two, you have country pairs, which are both above median cultural similarity and above median economic distance. So you have very high economic gains and low cultural gains. Okay, so it means for these pairs of country, you should have very low cultural selection. Okay. If when you have very low cultural selection, you believe the dissemination model, you should get more convergence for these uh, pairs of countries. Uh, if you believe the cultural remittances model, you should get less convergence when you have high economic gains and low cultural gains because you will get end up with low cultural selection. And you see here that the results supports, again, the cultural remittances channel because you have less convergence. That's the conclusion. Whatever you do goes, and then when you do plausibility checks, again, the same thing. Uh, all the empirical exercises we do point to the same direction, knocked out victory by knocked out of the cultural remittances mechanism over the cultural dissemination one. So our conclusion is that, you know, if you want to talk as a global thinker, about how migration is changing global culture, uh, the most important dimension that you should uh, think about is the trans cultural transformation of the sending countries uh, through cultural remittances rather than the cultural transformation of receiving countries through cultural dissemination. And of course, this uh, creates a really, I would say, a lot of uh, we call this inconsistency between what our findings and the dominant questions in, in this debate. Thanks a lot, Ilel. We have already four questions in the queue. So Yanai, Marlon, Adam, and then Delia. Yanai, can you unmute? It's just a, a comment okay, go on. Uh, regarding the uh, selection model. I'm, if I understood you correctly, I think we still need to take into account the fact that 
the Roy Bochas model is not a straightforward prediction on the relative probability to migrate by uh, skills. It's also dependent on the relative inequality or actually the relative returns to skill in the sending and the receiving country. Yeah. Okay, but we use this not until I talk about high skill, low skill. Huh? Uh, do you hear me? You, you, you seem not to hear me. We do hear you. Okay, but Yanai doesn't seem to, to hear me. Anyway, uh, I agree with that, but uh, this is consistent with uh, the way we, we used it. I, I agree that it's a, it's a more complete description of the model that you said, but it doesn't change the, the result. I mean, this is inequality, which is creating these differential wage profiles, which uh, uh, drive uh, the, the fact that relative returns are higher for low skill. Okay, so Marlon? Thanks, Simone. Uh, thanks, Hillel, for the presentation. My question, to which Arthur has already uh, partly answered, is since you, you, you know, identification is an issue and you have this, uh, this theory already, already set up, couldn't you go fully structural? Uh, so Arthur says that the, the current model is not, uh, may, may not be realistic enough. So my follow-up question would be, what would it take to make the model more realistic, for instance, having a continuum of types instead of just two types, or I don't know, having beliefs as a, a composite of uh, like a CS aggregate of different uh, values in the in the country, something like that. Okay, uh, I don't have a substantial answer. Uh, I, I'll take a, a joker based on subjective taste. This is the type of papers I like and models I like and empirical analysis I like. And, and, and uh, so maybe structural models in acquired, is an acquired taste, but I have not acquired it yet. So again, uh, warned you, it's not on the substance. Okay, Adam? Yes, hello. So I was just wondering regarding the empirical part uh, for your outcome variable when you were measuring uh, cultural similarity. If I understood well, it's uh, basically an index of 30 different cultural dimensions. So I was just wondering which ones are the most important. So did you try to go dimension by dimension? And especially since I guess that some of the dimensions could have op uh, opposite effects. So yeah, that's it. Yes, we, we do in the appendix uh, of the paper. So I, uh, I point you to the appendix, but frankly, uh, on the top of my head, I, I can't tell you which ones uh, are more, you know, drive the, the overall results. But yeah, we do uh, look uh, at, you know, what are the values you want to uh, transfer to your children, which is a set of questions in the world value survey. We look at uh, the priorities in life, the general trust questions and so on. I don't, okay. it's not that, you know, these dimensions are fundamentally different in, in terms of real, but there are certainly heterogeneous results which can be interesting to exploit. We, we say a word on it, but don't, you know, it's not central in, in the paper. It's in, in the appendix, but it's there. Thanks. Uh, Delia? I actually had the same thought that Adam did, and I'll just ask a follow-up question related to something that someone brought up in the chat. If there is such a thing as good norms and bad norms, then a theory may be that the good norms are transmitted back to the home country and the good norms from the home country are transmitted or disseminated into the host country. I don't know if there would be an objective way to say which are the good norms and which are the bad norms, but I would be very interested to see if you could, if you could yeah. find evidence of such a prediction in your model, in your data. Well, no, this is only something we did not think about. We will be careful to use blue and, and, and green, uh, trying to avoid any color that would imply good or bad. Yeah. Uh, so no, that's something we did not think about. Yeah, we, we'll think about it, but I, I think in the end of the day, it's a, it's a value judgment and uh, in principle, uh, I'd like to avoid, yeah. But, but, but you can think of things such as, uh, you know, there is a whole literature where there are, you know, things like you know, preference for the future, uh, individualism, and these type of things which have a higher economic payoff. If this is what you have in mind, yeah, that can be something that could be explored probably. Thanks. Thank you. 
Thank you for, for a very interesting talk. And I also wanted to follow up on Delia's question on um, you don't want to make a value judgment, but um, aren't the people who are worried about cultural divergence exactly concerned about democracy, inclusion, um, rights for women, minorities? Uh, mm -hmm. And shouldn't we, uh, and uh, is your measure really picking that up? Uh, I'm worried about that. So we're not, uh, I mean, the results are not for a very specific uh, question, but uh, if this is your worry, you should be reassured, uh, I think, because uh, what, what, you, what we find essentially is that what matters is the trans control transmission from receiving countries to sending countries. So to the extent that most of the migration and the one that is behind the results is, is mostly a south-north migration, so migration from developing to uh, richer countries, then you have transmission of uh, cultural values from the receiving countries to the sending countries, which are uh, poor countries, less democratic, and so on. So yes, if your worry is the dissemination of democracy, then you should be happy with the results that, uh, you know, it's not that uh, rich countries import theocratic values or autocratic values, but they export democratic values. Thanks. Inma, one last question. Hi. Hi, Hillel. How are you? Hello. Very nice presentation. Thank you. I just uh, was curious to know if you also consider foreign direct investment. I, uh, also in relation to these bilateral time variant factors. No. No, we haven't. Okay. Uh, so we, yeah, in principle, we could. Uh, there mm -hmm. is data on this. Yeah, I mean, it should be important to do it if we have uh, evidence that, you know, as for trade, capital flows convey uh, cultural transmission. If you know references on this, we, we're happy to, to get that. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thanks to Miguel, Arthur and Sulin. I'm, I'm calling the day. So thanks a lot for, uh, to all of you for being online with us today and I hope to see you as well in, in the next seminars. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.